Okay, thanks very much. Um, yes, as any good conference uh, speaker, I've changed the title of my slides at the last moment, but I am going to talk about what uh, was just int introduced there. Security, that's my word. That is it, yeah, and that's the key word. There it is up on, up on the screen. Um, just to introduce myself very quickly, um, I used to be a director of a company called Euromoney, so I've been a FTSE 250 company director. I've been a journalist, a publisher, and an editor for 25 years in wholesale finance, so your business. And I'm now, for the last five years, working in various aspects of cybersecurity, including working with some banks, uh, some large organizations. AKJ Associates itself does that, and it also runs events a little bit like this one in the cybersecurity area. I'm sure you're familiar with the basics of cybersecurity. I'm hoping to give you a few new perspectives on why I think it's actually even more important than everybody thinks it is. So we all know that you guys are the big targets. Financial institutions are where the money is. That's why people used to rob you with guns, and it's why they now rob you with computers. These are just three of the latest attacks. I mean, you're all familiar with things like the Bangladesh attack, which was executed via the SWIFT network. Um, we've had Tesco Bank. Tesco is a disastrous company. It has been hacked in every possible way, in every single piece of its organization. If you online shop with Tesco, you will be hacked. If you bank with them, you will be hacked. Uh, they are best to be avoided. Presumably, there is no one from Tesco here to sue me, so that's all right. Um, again, we have the Russian Central Bank, which is like Bangladesh, so we have central banks being attacked. And we have Professor Richard Benham, uh, who is a respected academic and chairman of the National Cyber Management Center, saying a major bank will fail as a result of a cyber attack in 2017, leading to a loss of confidence and a run on that bank. So um, we will hold him to that prediction at the end of the year. But it just shows how seriously people are taking this. I talked to the Bank of England about the Bangladesh attack, and he said it was a real wake-up call. They had taken cybersecurity seriously before. They had made you guys follow certain rules and regulations, but they're now going to completely up their game, including their own internal cybersecurity game. They hadn't really thought about themselves as being a target. Um, the reason uh, I think cybersecurity is more important than everybody thinks it is is because I look at it from the outside and I don't think anyone really is taking it very seriously. Um, banks are good because they're heavily regulated, they do hire staff, they have got CISOs, Chief Information Security Officers, and CTOs, and CIOs, and all sorts of other people, some of whom are senior, it depends on the bank. Um, we'll come on to that. Um, but if you look at some of these just comments, um, the the amount of damage that the claims are made for cybersecurity do not seem to me to meet the amounts of money being spent on it. Um, so these are Gartner are the big cybersecurity sort of research firm, Forrester is another, and it doesn't really matter what the exact numbers are, but if trillions of dollars are at risk, why are such small amounts of money being used to purchase cybersecurity software and spent on cybersecurity staff? And also, why are the vendors so small? I mean, the, vendor, the, the solution providers that you rely upon outside your own internal mechanisms are mostly tiny companies. Um, in a lot of cases, they're literally startups with you know, three or four software engineers who've put a sales team together, got some VC money, most of it from the US, and are running around the world trying to flog you solutions that, frankly, most of the time do not work and are certainly not scalable and will not work in the future. Um, and so if you just look as an outsider, and I'm an outsider, publisher, editor, journalist. If you just look at the industry itself, you look at it and you think, there's a lot of noise here, there's a lot of hype, and lots of people are saying the right thing, but are people doing the right thing? Um, and again, these are just other points about, um, you know, how do you prove people are taking things seriously? Again, I look at seriousness in terms of how much money you're spending, how senior your security staff are, how much influence they have over the business. I've done quite a lot of work with banks, and inside those banks, the business unit always wins. If the business unit says, I want to do X for revenue, they do that. Everybody else falls in place behind them. The DevOps teams, the software teams, everyone has to do what the business says. And then even behind them, security. So instead of security being front and center, it's absolutely at the back of the queue in lots of organizations. Um, outside banking, although of course banks are in the FTSE, uh, only 5% of FTSE 100 groups have a designated executive director who could answer questions sensibly on cybersecurity if, for example, they were at an AGM. 
Um, that is not taking cybersecurity seriously. And this is not a new sector. AKJ was f formed in 1993 with the UK government to talk about cybersecurity. It's not like this happened yesterday. And that, that FT article, I've just taken my glasses off. I can't see when it was. It's, ve it's a very recent article. So that's not, that's not particularly good. And again, if you look down the, uh, the right-hand side, um, you have all sorts of other statistics, which I think bear out my point. Hasn't that, that changed for the last year? I'm over here. No, no, here, here. Oh, uh, there you are. Haven't that changed? Well, that's a very recent article. I mean, it's very, very, very recent. I mean, I pulled that off, um, you know, in the last month or two. So it, it, it is, I think we're at the very, very beginning of a new phase, and I'll come on to that, a new phase of where we think cybersecurity is, because the threats are changing and the response is changing. And the responses are changing as well. But the question is, are they changing fast enough? And I think, well, you'll see what I think about that. Okay. Um, this is just, this just made me laugh. This is an advert for a senior cybersecurity person posted on LinkedIn. I have complete, this is exactly as it appeared, except with any identification removed. Uh, the interesting things, you know, it's quite a large organization. It's a, they'll take a contract guy. Don't have to be permanent to be the cybersecurity chief of this company. You can just be a temp, uh, which means you can leave whenever you, you want. You're paid 650 pounds a day. Now that's, that's quite good money. You know, but it's not the kind of money you'd expect a C-suite executive to be paid who's responsible for the security of your entire organization and potentially existential business continuity risk. Um, you, at least you've got to stay for six months. I mean, that's something. Um, and, um, you know, what? I mean, that's just extraordinary. And that, again, is a recent advertisement. Again, doesn't, it tells me that at least one organization is not taking this seriously. Uh, You've all got CISOs. I think probably every large FI in this room will have somebody whose job title is something like Chief Information Security Officer. If, if you don't, obviously, that I would consider to be a problem. The, the, the next problem is, what do these people do? Uh, in the organizations which I talk to, which is hundreds and hundreds of organizations, AKJ's biggest event has 700 of these people in a room, uh, they are the most extraordinarily random group of people. They are former policemen. They're former spies. They are heads of IT. Um, they come from Ernst & Young or KPMG or Accenture. Uh, they, um, they're sometimes lawyers. There seems to be no rhyme or reason or set of qualifications that one has to have to be one of these people. Some of them say that it's not an IT job. It's about leadership. It's about awareness. It's about training. Other people say, my god, if you say that, the whole organization is finished. It's all about IT. So there's no agreement really on what this person or persons uh, does. And they all end up doing two things as far as I can work out, apart from leaving. One of them is uh, they, um, they get very heavily involved in awareness training and phishing, because still most malware is delivered through email. You and I, we're the worst victims of this. We click on silly things, we download malware. You know, we are the problem. So if you can put in a solution from PhishMe, for example, you can get rid of a lot of that problem, but of course not all of it, because somebody in this room, and I was hacked three days ago, is going to click on something stupid. I clicked on something stupid. I was on the telephone. I wasn't paying attention. I had to change every single password I could as quickly as possible. Um, and one of the results of these people being a bit random is that if you really start talking to them about how close to the levers of change and power they are, they're a very, very long way away. Uh, a friend of mine has just left the CISO role at one of the Magic Circle law firms in London because after 18 months he had never met a senior partner. He had come from a bank. He was very highly paid. He left because he was frustrated. Um, they, they wanted a CISO because it looks good. They did not want to do anything actually to do with cybersecurity. And at one point they were rung up by a bank client of theirs who said, we want you to secure all communications with us. And the law firm decided that what that meant was they would direct all communications to that law firm through one phone line and encrypt only that phone line, leaving all the other phone lines through which they did all their other business, and this phone and data lies completely unencrypted. The mentality that will encrypt one set of communications to one bank and not the rest completely baffles me. Um, I'll skip through this very quickly, it, it's, but it basically... These are the different kinds of CISO that institutions tend to hire. Um, all of them do not do what a cybersecurity chief should do. They do small elements of it. Um, 
A lot of it is compliance like tick box checking, and of course with GDPR coming along, that's got even more prevalent. Many organizations are very happy to comply, particularly FIs, I have to say. Compliance obviously is extraordinarily important to you guys. You have to comply, but compliance is not security. Um, and if you focus on compliance, you will not be secure. Um, and of course, some of them, these CISOs are hired simply to step in front of a train. The, the, the board knows something's coming down the line. You hire someone, they discover it. The train runs them over, you fire them. Happy days. So, again, we're not anywhere close to having the right staff in the right places to deal with this problem. And that's a big problem because um, cybercrime is just crime. Fraud is the crime at the end of most cybercrime, and cyber is just the mechanism through which the crime is executed. Um, and unfortunately for us, that mechanism is now getting very efficient. It's very scalable. That particular DDoS attack, which was um, through a French ISP, used 150,000 essentially you know, webcams, things like that, to, uh, to, 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 to basically create the world's largest denial of service attack. Um, and the Internet, of, the Internet of Things is going to make all of this much worse. Um, I was in Abu Dhabi recently, and they're talking about what a fantastic thing it is to have a smart city. I think smart cities are a very dumb idea. If you connect everything in the city before you've sorted out security, and we have not sorted out security, you haven't got a smart city, you've got the most vulnerable city in the world. Um, and with artificial intelligence being used on both sides of this equation, uh, you're going to have machine versus machine cyber war. In fact, it, it exists already. Um, and so again, if you look at the infrastructure that institutions and organizations have built, are they able to deal with that level of scale? I'll pop through that. And then there's another thing. So you're now dealing with a big IT problem, uh, increase in scale of attacks, increase in sophistication of attackers. You've all heard about nation states, the Russians and the North Koreans, as well as you know, your Belarusian criminal gangs and your Ukrainian criminal gangs and your Chinese criminal gangs. Um, so you're fighting that fire, and then suddenly there's a new fire, and that fire is that your third-party stakeholders are starting to take a big interest in this. So what do I mean by that? I mean all the people who invest in the stocks and shares, the bonds, uh, the other securities of financial institutions have suddenly woken up to this and said, this is a, this is a value problem. If you guys don't do this properly, um, you're worth less. <coughs> Excuse me. And so if you, you see that, sorry, I'm just going to grab some water. So if you, if you look here, you have hedge funds shorting companies who they think are weak. You have investment managers lobbying for compulsory cyber audits. Your insurers obviously need to know what you're doing because if they're going to give you cyber insurance, they need to know that you know what your core assets are, where they are, how they're protected. They won't insure a house if you leave the windows open. The problem with cybersecurity is no one has a definition of what leaving the windows open is. And so how do you prove to your insurers that you have put in place adequate protections? And if we go back to the theme of the conference, which is digital transformation, how do you prove to an insurer that in the middle of a radical business model uh, change, in which you are creating new websites, new processes, incorporating new payments mechanisms, and so on, how in the middle of that process can you possibly convince an insurer that you are cyber secure enough for them to give you coverage? At the moment, probably doesn't matter, they haven't got enough capacity to insure you, but at some point you're going to want that mitigation. And so if you start now, you may be able to persuade them that you are secure. Will you um, be able in, in any time to be fully cyber secure? No. No. You can, you, you, what you're aiming for is resilience. You're aiming, it's, it, I, th I think it's more like um, health and safety. I mean, if you're BP, occasionally you are going to blow up the Gulf of Mexico. Um, that, is a, that is an operating risk that is going to occur. The question is, if you kill people in Texas and in the Gulf of Mexico, have you now been careless? Are you now beyond the natural boundaries of where your health and safety machinery should be? Cybersecurity is the same. If you're breached once every 10 years, maybe that's that's the cost of doing business. But if you are continually breached, so Yahoo breached twice between, what, 2012 and 2015. They're a large internet company. They're not supposed to be dumping half a billion names into the, the hackers' hands. Then 
I think it's fair to say that you, you're not competent at it. So the question is, yeah, how do you get resilient? Um, yes, Yahoo. Um, <coughs> the only interesting thing I think about this is that uh, that lady, she's earned $200 million plus the $186 million she gets from the, uh, the deal. Um, the data breaches cost the deal, the M&A deal, $350 million, um, and she was fined by the company $14 million. Well, if you said to me, I'll give you $386 million, but I'll fine you $14 million if you're not cyber secure, I, I take the $386 million. Um, so I don't think Yahoo were taking it very seriously either. Uh, and that's M&A. Uh, th there are now big issues with valuing deals involving anybody who has any form of digital business. Because if you buy a business that then contains cybersecurity problems, including things like Yahoo, i.e. hidden actual data breaches that you have not disclosed, the valuation of those deals is suspect. And of course, you can be buying something that can bring you down. Cybersecurity is an existential business threat, so you can be purchasing a time bomb. Um, a few hedge funds have decided they're going to short people they think are cyber incompetent, and a very few have decided that what they might do is hire researchers to find out your weaknesses, publish them, and short the stock at the same time. Um, it's not illegal, and um, the kind of sophistication of the people that they're using to find out how weak you are is very high. So if you hire very good hackers to find zero-day exploits into your organizations, you then publish the fact that, you know, Deutsche Bank can be hacked in X way through its autobahn trading system, and at the same time you've shorted the stock, I mean, you're, you're, you're on for a good thing. So it gives you some idea of the other side of the fire. The fire there's one side of the fire, which is the IT side, where you've, you've got to hire the right people, spend the right money, you've got to do all of those things. But at the other, the other end of the scale, you've actually got sophisticated people trying to profit from your, your weaknesses in a, more, in a, in a different way. Um, tons more regulation. You know about regulation. You know about GDPR. You know that the U.S. government is trying to make uh, cyber regulation uh, more rigorous. Again, external scrutiny. It just means this stuff is coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. So at the same time as the threatscape is getting bigger, at the same time as the hacks are getting more sophisticated and the volumes are increasing, you're being attacked by your investors on another side, the regulators on another side. So suddenly the cybersecurity, which really four or five years ago was a real back office activity, is now front and center of your compliance efforts. Your board is looking at it because of the valuation issues. Uh, it, it's, it's a critical, critical business value issue. And it cuts to the heart of digital transformation. Because everything that you're trying to do in this room that you were hearing about in the morning can be secure or it can be insecure. Um, and if it's insecure, you're creating existential risks for your business. So being a CISO is the most difficult job in the financial sector? Um, it's the That's least, what, what it's, you're presenting. It's got the worst pay to uh, risk ratio. ratio, yes, I would say probably. Um, it's thankless. Everyone who works in IT, I don't know how many people in the room would say they were IT people, but IT strikes me as being quite a thankless business. Everyone criticizes, criticizes you when things don't work. How many people congratulate you when it, it goes right? I mean, three people out of a thousand. So the CISO is the same. No attacks, no congratulations. First sign of an attack, damnation. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a thankless task. Um, investors, again, talked about this. Uh, basically, um, large UK investors are now demanding written transparency on cybersecurity, that's going to spread. Um, and it makes cybersecurity part of governance, it makes it part of ESG, it makes it part of transparency to your investors. And again, that level of questioning is just going to increase and increase and increase and increase and increase. So instead of being able to just give that nice story of digital transformation, I'm Kaisha Bank, we've invented Imagine Bank, it's our millennials bank, it's only online, it's only for social media, and expecting praise and valuation hike, you could equally have someone stand up and go, well, doesn't that just threaten your entire bank with cybersecurity issues? And suddenly all the lovely value of that new initiative is, is negated. Um, and the solutions don't work. 
I was asked the question earlier, can you be secure? You can be more secure than you were yesterday. You can't be 100% secure. Um, and it's quite interesting that the presidents and the senior people in the industry think the industry doesn't work. So Tanium is quite a big, quite famous um, cybersecurity company. Our industry has really failed the market. Uh, President of RSA, another um, cybersecurity company. The cybersecurity industry is fundamentally broken. GCHQ, we've done a lot over the past five years, spent quite a lot of money. It hasn't worked. I mean, that's not overly encouraging, I would suggest. Um, so, running out of time, can you fix it? Because that's the real question, okay? So far you were a little bit of gloomy, I would say. I, and I'm not going to back off that. It, 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 it's been a very there, difficult situation, but what, no, can, what can people in this room, the comments that they're representing, do about that? Well, I think, I, I'm not sure these comments are going to go, these aren't comments and may not go down very well, but the work I've done with banks hasn't suggested to me that the way that IT and these functions are structured in banks is particularly efficient when it comes to this kind of problem. So they have to change their structure as well? So, if I, For example, the two banks I've worked with recently, the IT teams are largely contractors. Um, but they're very long-term contractors, which I think is the worst possible thing you can do. Consultants run those teams largely, and the, the, the internal team of the bank is quite small, which creates multiple scattered teams with different objectives. It's very expensive. There are staff quality issues, certainly in the UK. Um, and we've all been on the other end of IT promises. It's coming in November, which year? It, you know, that's the, the basic question. Um, and the culture of the banks themselves. The senior management of banks, who I used to deal with all the time at Euromoney, talk a good line in cybersecurity. But if you go and meet the guys on the ground who are trying to implement it, the, the constant complaint they have is, I'm not getting management backup. I'm trying to move this through the organization, but the business stands in my way, or even just the next team down the road stands in my way. Um, so you've got to change the whole way that you do the digital transformation in your structure. Um, the main thing, though, is to recognize that it's a, it is a core business value risk. It is an IT risk, but the real issue going forwards is that actually a business value risk, and that digital transformation without a very much more significant focus on cybersecurity from the bottom up, DevOps, application security, all of it, API security, w without that, digital transformation is actually just as dangerous as not doing anything at all. So I've rushed through that, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. I hope some of it was news to you and interesting, and I hope it's given you something to think about. Um, and I will now leave... I think that a lot of people here will think about a lot, what <laughs> you said. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.